a new webinar. So, okay, how does a per printed circuit board get its coffee, uh, its morning caffeine? It always goes for a quick JavaScript. <laughs> is that rough? Is that is that bad? Okay, uh, not so great. Okay, why was the printed circuit board feeling congested? Because it had it was having a hard time processing. Um, so, okay, so uh, where can you find the webinar afterwards? Great question, Jonathan. Um, let me see here. Uh, so we are going to um, make it available in a couple ways. Uh, it's going to be on our YouTube channel. Um, it will also be on a uh, Google Share Drive that I will email all the attendees with a link to that as well. So we will have that. Okay. All right. More, you know, with these webinars, right? Nobody, like everybody sits in there and nobody does anything. So I thought, I thought these jokes would be a lot better. Um, okay. So why don't printed circuit boards ever get lost? Because they follow their own path. I mean, that's, that's good stuff, right? Good stuff. <laughs> All right. We got a couple more minutes. Just too excited about this. There you go. Hello, everybody. Do, 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 do. OK. All right, I have more chat GPT printed circuit board design um, jokes. <clears throat> Why did the printed circuit board break up with its partner? There was too much resistance in their relationship. <laughs> uh, engineering humor, it's the best. All right, go. I don't want to run through all the rest of my jokes too quickly. I only have th four more. I could do one more. OK. Why are printed circuit boards always broke? They always, they always give out free chips. I don't think uh, Chat GPT is going to be doing stand up anytime soon. So, there's Corey. Welcome, welcome, everybody. All right. Okay. Patrick, I'm going to mute you um, unless you had wanted to chime in before we get started. Uh, let's see if I can. Uh, uh, you hear me? Can yeah, I can hear you. Oh, good, because yeah, I was just getting my audio. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What's the intro, intro? What were we doing? Uh, we're 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 getting ready to get this party started in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, right right now, I'm just telling uh, uh, jokes about printed circuit boards oh, that okay. I I got from Chat GPT. Ah, right, you are ready for another one? Oh wait. Got more people. All right, Nitin, welcome, welcome, everybody. Yeah. All right. Oh, hey, Nitin. Okay. Right. I'm going to mute some people. All right, who's not muted? All right, Patrick, I'm going to mute you, man, but I want you to talk later. All right, Terry, I'm going to mute you, too. Um, definitely want you guys to chime in at the end with any questions you have. Okay. Here's another chat GPT winner. Um, how does a print circuit board uh, get around town? It takes the bus, the data bus. <laughs> yeah. OK, and um, I'm going to I'm going to tell the last one here and then um, we're going to wait one more minute uh, just to let some more people come in. Um, uh, one of the attendees here is uh, Corey Davis. He's one of our engineers on, on the Fastway team. I think he's in Alaska right now. Um, so, uh, okay, you ready? Here's the last uh, cheap chat GPT um, uh, joke about printed circuit boards. Okay, why did the printed circuit board go to the doctor? Because it had a bad case of a chip on its shoulder. Hilarious. <laughs> Okie doke. We are ready to get rolling. Okay. Oh, 
make sure everybody is getting in here. Yes, come on in. All right, a couple more people here. Just getting them in. You guys missed all of my chat GPT PCB jokes. Um, that's OK. No judging. OK, you guys ready? I'm Luke Gelman. Wait, there's a little echo here. OK, I'm Luke Gelman. Uh, I am the director of sales for Fastway Engineering. Welcome to the Design for Electronics Reliability webinar. Today, we're going to provide you with invaluable insights and knowledge and help you design and manufacture superior PCBs and enhance the reliability of your electronic designs. So you guys know this is being recorded, so you guys can revisit it later, share it with con colleagues um, who couldn't attend. We're going to be putting it in a Google Drive with a link to the video as well as uh, it will be on YouTube as well. Uh, we encourage you guys to actively participate at the end by asking questions. Um, we want you guys to get a lot out of what we're putting together today. So without dragging this out any further, let me introduce our esteemed speaker, Jim Saw, uh, an expert in design and simulation. Without further ado, uh, let's welcome Jim Shaw to the virtual stage. All right, thanks, Luke. Can you hear me OK? Audio coming through. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. We uh, put together this presentation ballpark 30 minutes, but I might get a little chatty. Luke will yell at me and throw something at me if, if I get too chatty in, in, in the details and the technical side. But what we want to do today is do a brief overview of different failure types for printed circuit boards, kind of set the stage for as a design engineer, as a design engineer who works on a team that's trying to deliver an electronics assembly, what are all of the potential failure modes that I'm trying to design around? And then of course, how can we use simulation to predict those? Because if we can predict a failure, we can then design around it, right? We can prevent it. And what's the big deal? Why, why is it so important that we have to be able to predict these failures and design around them? First and foremost, every one of us realizes that we are on a team and that team is expensive we're all very expensive very well trained people we have a business to run we have work on a team that needs to be making sure that the development costs the cost of br bringing a product to market is going to be small enough that we can make a make our money on the back end right we're going to be increasing the amount of electronics that pass our initial test we call that first pass yield right not so many failures off their production line in the first hundred, let's say. With simulation, we're going to be predicting and re reducing the number of warranty issues and customer returns, right? We're literally going to predict thousands of different failure modes, thousands of different test points on this elect on any given electronic circuit board, or if you have an assembly that has multiple boards, we're going to be able to distill that down to every single solder pad, every single uh, gull wing, every single connector, every single ball uh, grid array, uh, etc. We're going to be able to do that and ultimately predict the mean time between failure on our circuit boards and reduce that, um, or at least have that match our warranty, at least what we're, we're, we're claiming out there in the field, right? And then the, the last two reasons why simulation is important in order to predict PCB failures are maybe some things that aren't so uh, obvious. The first is increasing the complexity of your design, increasing the number of features, right? As a design engineer, I'm getting pressure from the marketplace, from my boss, from my customer, from our partners, from the supply chain. I'm getting that pressure to pack more features into a small piece of real estate, if you will, right? I want more components on a small board. I want this thing on my wrist, my wearable, to do a million different things so I can charge more money and et cetera, et cetera, add more value to the patient or whomever is gonna be using the products. And then lowering the cost. A lot of people think that simulation's number one goal is to make the part better, make it last longer, make the performance greater. And although that is a goal for many, many, many designers, a lot of people forget that we use simulation to reduce the cost. And in electronics and a PCB, which has hundreds of different components, right? Resistors and capacitors, discretes and ICs, right? Anytime I can reduce the cost, I can move from a high quality resistor to a low quality resistor or one with a very tight tolerance to one with a very broad tolerance. Anytime I can, I can do that, that gets multiplied by thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of times. And if I'm able to predict the failure of my board 
and make that decision early on, I'm literally reducing the cost of, of this design uh, using simulation. So we're going to walk through that a little bit with a couple of slides. And of course, as you guys know, Luke and I, we're never going to give you just slides. We're always going to open up the tool. We're going to do a live demo. We'll show you one of our reliability analysis tools called Sherlock. Uh, and then after that, we're going to kind of recap and we'll have it uh, sort of an open Q&A afterwards. So Let's dig into just a brief overview of, I'll say, the top five, maybe. Uh, who knows? There's dozens of different ways a PCB could fail, but some common ones for those that are probably familiar, of course, we have a short or a CAF burnout, right? When we have two leads or something that are too close together, too much current, too much voltage. And again, we're getting pressure to put more things on board. So boards are getting denser and we're trying to crank up the power and we're trying to manage that, right? There is no discussion around the reliability of electronics without discussion of the bathtub curve, right? We've got infant mortality on the far left. We've got wear out on the far right. And the reality is the wear out of the board is defined by the wear out of the worst component, right? Your board is going to fail as a whole as soon as one component fails first, right? That's usually what happens when, when a customer starts to recognize, hey, this thing isn't working well. One component. If we can predict which component that is and make that one change, we could extend the life of the board just by making one change. And it's really nice to do that when we're on the computer as opposed to doing that in, in physical test. Integrated circuit test, AKA the bed of nails, right? We want to be using this bed of nails to be testing the board, to be flexing it, to be twisting it, to be putting all kinds of strains on it so that we can check to see if our solder pads are up to snuff. Do we have enough material, if you will, in place, right? Are we going to pop off, if you will, one of the balls on the ball grid array or pop off one of the components, right? So with a bed of nails test, I'm able to check that. Well, a bed of nails test isn't free, right? I have to design the board and then I have, as a designer, I'm designing the, the, the test fixture, right? So what if I'm able to do that in the computer? And what if I'm able to do that in parallel with actually designing the board? Of course, on the bottom right, we have all of the various different ways that we can fail a solder joint. I mean, this is three of the many, right? Reality is you cannot see these in real life, right? Uh, the picture in the middle, right? That's a failure of the board, actually. The laminate underneath the ball, underneath an IC, right? You're never going to be able to see that unless you start using x-rays. And you're not going to x-ray every single ball on every single IC on every single board that you manufacture. You, it's just not economical. So if there's a way to predict for a given structural or thermal load, how much stress, how much strain is going to be in the solder? I want to know, and I want to know that soon so I can design around it. And then PTA, short plate through hole fatigue, again, really, really, really thin copper, straight through the center of the board from the top side to the bottom side. You can't physically see it. We're not going to cut the board in half to check, right? How are we able to predict some of these soft materials like copper and solder? Are they able to withstand a lifetime out in the field, right? Particularly in automotive, aerospace, mobility industry, and even others. Even if it's inside a building, right? We're going to have it being loaded or there's going to be some sort of cycling going on. So we want to be able to predict those failures before we, we start prototyping and, and certainly before the customer is going to get the board, right? So the typical design process, right, might look like this. I would call it the old school way, right? Step one, design. Step two, build. Step three, test. Step four, uh-oh, right? We've got a physical test and a physical board. And if that's the point that we are finally realizing that we're going to fail the board, we have a big issue, right? So various studies out there from different marketing firms, et cetera, basically three quarters of the total cost, the total product development cost can be spent in this physical, iterative, test, fail, fix, repeat phase. We need to avoid that. And if you wait to test, if you wait to that point of the phase to, to realize, uh-oh, um, we, we probably should have predicted this, you, you've already kind of lost a battle, if you will. So we'll have to deploy simulation on the next one, right? When we deploy simulation, right, what we're doing is we're moving this fault detection, if you will, or this, this failure found, we're moving that up. We're making it earlier, 
We're doing it in the digital aspect of product development, right? There's no paper yet. There's no supply chain yet. Uh, I don't have to physically test or physically prototype. We're doing this all on the computer, which we're going to be on the computer anyways, because as a PCB designer, I'm going to be sitting in an ECAD tool laying out traces and components or an MCAD tool trying to package electronics so it can survive the environment. So what we're really talking about today is I want to take this, this step of the process that I have to do, which is test, and I'm moving it into the computer. And when we do that, we reduce the costs and we reduce the costs as directly related to how much you're spending. Imagine if you go to test and you don't have to break. Imagine going to test knowing you're gonna pass and all you're doing on the test is checking the box. So I call myself a designer, an electronics designer, as a mechanical engineer, that's my background. You may have a background in thermal, a background in electrical, maybe a background in manufacturing and you found your way into the sort of the reliability space, right? I don't think we all go to college for a reliability degree per se, we kind of stumble our way into this. But as a design engineer, I have requirements, right? I'm being told these are the constraints of the problem. You need to make sure that the EMI, EMC are not a risk to your product so that you're not out there engaging with other antennas and, uh, and losing and dropping signals, right? You need to make sure as an engineer designer for electronics that this can withstand some potentially extreme environment, right? Shock, vibration, thermal, right? Even if we're not designing for a very, very hot environment, I'm being asked to pack a bunch of features, a bunch of components into the small space possible, and we're not allowed to have a fan, right? And th those are big decisions. So as a, as a designer, my goal is to improve reliability and performance, two kind of generic things. But with simulation, I quantify that. I turn reliability into a hard number. I turn performance into a hard number, and I'm checking that at a thousand different points in the computer before we go to test. So what we're gonna walk you through, just want a couple of slides before we jump into the actual tool here is sort of the full stack, right? And we understand that not a lot of companies, not a lot of engineering teams have the ability to command the full stack, right? Where you're simulating everything and you don't have to. I don't want you to think that it's an all or none game. It, it really isn't. It's a reliability game, but there's a lot that goes into stacking reliability prediction. And we're gonna show you guys right here a couple of different and tools that can be used in your team, right? Into your multidiscipline team. And one of the challenges that we have electronics, we call it the scale problem, right? We have potential failure modes at every single scale from the chip to the package, to the PCB and beyond, right? Into the cabinet, into the rack, into the building, into the whatever you're, you're putting your, your electronics into. And so the challenge here is how do we make sure that we're predicting reliability at every step of that of that way. So one particular way that we'll just propose here, right? You may have a team of electrical engineers, hopefully in house, and they're going to be responsible for the performance and reliability of the electrical aspects of the system, right? So what do they care about? They care about signal integrity, power integrity, and avoiding any sort of electromagnetic interference, right? This, as we define reliability, is an important part because if my electronics are communicating in some way, which that's what they do, they literally talk to themselves and to each other, I'm going to be held responsible as an electrical engineer. There's a whole full suite of electronics tools to do that, and that could be done sort of, I don't want to say in a, in a silo per se, but could be done by the electrical engineering team. Contrarily, we have a whole thermal environment we need to be concerned about, right? That could be uh, underneath the umbrella of the electronics team, that could, or excuse me, the electrical engineering team. That could be under the umbrella of the mechanical engineering team. But ultimately, your electronics are going to heat up, right? How much energy we punch in there, right? Voltage and current, how much energy goes into the system and how much of it gets turned to heat? A lot, right? Especially with really, really high density electronics that we have nowadays. Do I need a heat sink? Do I need a fan? Those are the things that we need to make a decision on well before we get to testing. And again, there's a whole suite of thermal tools that we use to do that. And they are some, some of them specifically designed to be targeting the trace level to the junction level, if you will, to the component, and then all the way up into, you know, an entire building, let's say, um, you know, uh, a, a rack of servers, if you will, that we, we might have that defines the cloud, right? So, so from a thermal perspective, we've got a whole uh, variety of tools. We might use those tools to feed into a reliability analysis. I'll show you what I'm, what we mean by that in a second. And of course, 
when I was a younger engineer, I had an electrical engineer kind of laugh a little bit and tell me, hey, you know what, Jim, all things fail mechanically. And that's the reality. Even if you have a, it could be a, a root cause software error, it could be electrical error, it could be some other thing, but ultimately there's going to be a mechanical failure that happens. And that's usually what sort of flags up to the customer. Hey, something's not acting right. You know, I've got some some fatigue uh, fracture or some sort of solder ball has done isn't isn't uh, connected anymore or something. So, you know, from a mechanical standpoint, we as mechanical engineers have a lot of work to do. We're dealing with brittle things. We're dealing with soft things. We're dealing with a lot of material properties that are all packed into one spot. You know, we might look at, for example, shock and vibration. Those are very, very common environments that we need to qualify our electronics for, particularly in industries like aerospace and defense and the automotive industry and mobility, right? We're putting something smart, we're making it move, we're making it move on its own in the case of a lot of uh, the uh, autonomous vehicles we see coming out there. But even if you're not in those two industries, even if you're in, for example, uh, medical or consumer products, you have to ship your electronics. And in many, many cases, the worst mechanical environment that your electronics um, would be going into is, uh, shall I say, the Amazon truck or the, right, the, the, the Rivian trucks, the, uh, the, you know, nothing against the vehicle themselves, but there's a couple of people out there, they're, they're tasked with getting boxes from point A to point B and back again, and they're going to drop your box, okay? I'm sure everyone on the call here has had a drop box at some point in time. Uh, we don't want to have that be the case. We want to make sure that our electronics can withstand that. So we're able to do that in our mechanical tools. And again, what we're predicting here is feeding into the reliability game, right? We're feeding into the potential failure, right? Is it an EMI failure? Is it a thermal failure? Did, I dro did the box get dropped on the way to the customer? Ultimately, at the end of the game, it could be a warranty issue. We're trying to prevent that. We're trying to predict and prevent that. And then, of course, there's no conversation with Luke and I around simulation without talking about multi-physics. And again, this is the full stack. This is the what-if scenario. This is the, ooh, if I had all the tools, which we know most people don't have, all of the tools. But what does that look like? It looks like physics coupling. So I don't have an electrical engineering team doing electrical stuff, or the thermal engineering doing thermal stuff, a mechanical engineering doing, we don't have those silos. We have it all working together. We have electro, thermo, mechanical analyses. We're combining those physics in the computer because we're combining those physics in real life. We have no control over it in real life. It just happens. And there's a whole suite of tools that we have in our portfolio with ANSYS that can roll up, if you will, the physics from a, from a single physics level, from a component level, up to the system and up into the multi-physics. That's the full stack, okay? So that's the vision, that's the dream. We all wish we could have it. We usually don't, right? We usually have to be responsible for reliability. We're responsible for all those different failure modes. We just don't have all of those simulation tools yet. That's okay. The tool we're gonna be showing you guys here in a few minutes is called Sherlock. This is a reliability analysis tool, and it in itself is going to account for electrical, thermal, and mechanical reliability potential errors, roll that into a single tool to give you basically a pass fail. Thumbs up, thumbs down, like in Gladiator. Either you're gonna win or you're not gonna win. And so built into uh, our reliability simulation tool called Sherlock, we have a lot of standards. So for those who are obviously operating within a regulated industry, uh, you can feel safe that a lot of those standards have made their way into the algorithms that are inside of this tool, as well as over half a million library parts. So the whole key here is that we're gonna be taking our ECAD data, okay? So it's coming from Altium or Eagle or ORCAD or whatever our mentor graphics, whatever our, our sort of uh, 2D layout tool is, where we're laying out boards and putting traces, we're gonna bring that into our Sherlock environment. We're gonna uh, match it, sign it, if you will, to a thermal structural environment, and then we're gonna predict, is this board going to fail? And if so, how? So in a nutshell, what is ANSYS Sherlock? It is a single simulation software package that can take in a variety of different environments and spit out a single value. What is the MTBF mean time between failure of my circuit card, of my printed circuit board? What, how many cycles is it going to withstand electrical, thermal, structural, et cetera? How many can it withstand before it's going to fail? And when it fails, because all electronics will fail at some point in time, how long is it going to take? Because if I know that early on in the design phase, 
I'm not going to be guessing. I'm not going to be spending all that money in the testing phase. So let's take a look. We're going to do a live demo here. So let me just come out of my full screen mode and show you guys Sherlock. So Sherlock is a uh, an ECAD analysis tool, right? So even if you are not a an electrical engineer, let's say you're a thermal engineer, you're a mechanical engineer, you're going to be working on a team, whether that's in-house or with a supplier, that's going to own the ECAD data. They're going to be the ones laying out the board, placing components and putting everything in, okay? This is a quick screenshot of this environment. I'm importing my ECAD data. I've got every single piece of information needed to manufacture the board. That's what's going to go into my analysis tool. And what am I going to learn from that? You're going to combine all that together and get a series of curves. These curves are going to tell us, will my circuit card assembly, will my printed circuit board and all the components on it, all the solder pads, all the balls, all of the gullwing connectors, all of the, you name it, is it going to fail in the time that I expect it to? So for example, this is a life prediction graph. This is the single, if we were to take all the analysis that we've done upstream, structural, thermal, electrical, et cetera, manufacturing, you name it, and bury that into a single screenshot, right? Boom, here it is. What are we looking at? Well, the first thing I wanna show you is this gray horizontal and vertical line here. The horizontal line is at 20 and the vertical line is at 50, okay? These axes represent lifetime versus probability of failure. So the spec that we're comparing against right now is I wanna make sure that no more than 20% of my of potential failure probability will occur by five years, okay? So I've done my math, I've done my statistics, I've looked at my warranties, I've looked at history, I've looked at the market, how my customers are using my electronics, and I'm saying this needs to last five years. And in those five years, when I say it needs to last, I define that as at most 20% probability of failure. So let's take a look at this example board that we've put, we've, we've put in here. So uh, this gr this kind of green curve down here, this is the mechanical shock. So this board's gonna go into, we'll call it the mobility industry. So some sort of vehicle that's moving. And from a mechanical shock perspective, you can see that at five years, we have one to 2% potential probability of failure. Cool, from a shock perspective, the mechanical engineer can check the box and say, we do not have a concern here for mechanical shock. The brown curve, however, shows random vibe. Random vibe is showing that at five years, I'm actually at a 22% failure probability. That's not gonna work. And when I use Sherlock, when I use a reliability tool, I now can go back and find out exactly what won't work. Well, I go right over here to the left. These are all the different tests that it compared against, all the different uh, simulation tests that it ran. And I go down to my random vibe and I can see a listing right here, exactly where on the board Am I going to see a failure? You you just can't, it's so difficult to do this in real life, right? Because what we're checking is, we're checking the strain of the component, the solder pad it sits on. Um, we're looking at the data sheet data that's provided, the junction temperature, you name it, right? And we're able to compare every single reference designator, every single component on your board, could be hundreds of them. Each one's got dozens of solder pads. We're talking about potentially thousands of different points. You just can't physically, economically test that in real life, but we're able to do that in the computer, right? We don't have to make any sort of consolation like, oh, I don't have enough money to test everything. I'm just gonna test the, these 10 things. In Sherlock, you test everything, right? Remember, we brought in the ECAT data. We brought in every single piece of information needed to manufacture our circuit board and we're checking every single one. In this particular example, we've got about 10 reference designators that are all uh, gonna fail. They have 100% failure probability. That means the strain on the components too high. And because we brought in the ECAD data, that ECAD data includes the actual geometry. So this ECAD data has been rendered in Sherlock. It has been analyzed. And here, for example, is the results of a random vibration analysis. And we're looking at displacement, right? So in this particular board, I've got four uh, mounting holes in the corners. You can see those are the dark blue areas. And in the center, under this vibration, the middle of the board is, is, is bouncing up and down, right? And so that right there now gives me a story to tell. As a mechanical engineer, I'm going to take this story. I'm going to go back to my electrical engineers, go back to my team. Maybe I'm going back to my supplier, right? Maybe I'm using this tool to hold my supplier accountable 
for what they're going to deliver to me. I'm, I'm able to predict the future, right? Even when the supplier can't. And I'm going back to them saying, hey, listen, guess what? These 10 components, we need to make a change. We either need to move them, we need to, we need to change which package they are, or make some sort of uh, prediction, right? Now, that's just one example, right? And, and I don't want to dig into too many details here. Again, uh, Luke's going to throw a, a, a whatever he's got uh, his mouse at me or something. But, you know, that level of detail is happening for every single reference designator on the board, every single ICT point on the board. We're rolling that up into the statistical analysis. This is 10 different failure modes that we're looking for, right? Five of which we had shown in the beginning of the presentation, right? I've got 10. I think I might have 12 or 15 here. I'm rolling that up into a single score, okay? Now, this is uh, partially done. I don't have my score here. But as a company, what you'll do is you're going to define this is the score that is considered acceptable. And until you reach that score, you're going to go back to the drawing board. You're going to go back to do some redesign. Maybe I'm changing out components, you know, and then I'm going to keep checking, keep checking, right? Remember we talked about reducing the cost of the bill of material. You have a rule in your team. This is the score that's needed. Hey, we're killing it right now. Our score is way over. Maybe a score of, uh, of, of 99 and we want, you know, you know, 90 is okay. Guess what that means? Go to a cheaper component. Reduce the number of components. Take cost out. It's too reliable, right? We don't talk about that too often, but there is definitely something that's called too reliable, and it's brother is too expensive, right? If our part's going to last 100 years and our customers expect it to last 10, then we have an issue. We spent way too much time and it's too, uh, it, it's, it's too reliable, right? So those are some of the pieces of information that come out of the software. Uh, what goes into the software is, again, our structural and thermal environments here on the top left, all of our ECAD data from the board stack up to the parts list, to the net list. So the net list, right, that's the traces. Those are the connections. We're doing electrical connections. We're doing mechanical testing. And we have all of that with over 600,000 components in our library, OK? And the biggest costs in setting up these simulation tools is the cost of developing a library. And I know a couple people in the audience have done that before. Uh, and I'm sure hopefully you're nodding your head saying, yeah, that takes a long time. Guess what you get? You get 600,000. And in this particular case, what would happen is if you import a board and it has a component that's not in our library, it's going to guess based on the manufacturer's part number, and then you'll go back and audit it. In this example, we can see we have no orange. So everything that came in in our particular board is gonna be in our library already, and we're off to the races, because in that library is the thermal, the structural, the manufacturing information. So that that database itself is is, is worth its weight in gold. So um, that that brings us to about halfway, uh, I'll say 30 minutes into the, to the presentation, and I, that's about it. Luke, did I miss anything? Nope, I'm getting a thumbs up. OK, so that brings us back to uh, to the slide deck. So, you know, the purpose of today's presentation is not to dig deep into the the, the underhood equations and how the software works, but basically to understand that as a printed circuit board designer, you may be electrical, you may be thermal, you may be mechanical, right? You may be responsible for that particular physics, right? At the end of the day, we're all responsible for liability. And we've got a tool here that can import and bring in that manufacturing data, right? I can actually import a picture of a board from an IR camera. I don't need to use all those simulation tools. I don't need to have the full stack we just showed, okay? I just need to have enough information to roll up my reliability, right? So in a nutshell, as a designer, what am I doing now? Now that I have the ability to bring simulation up into the computer, I'm checking these tests and I'm, I'm basically testing it a thousand times, right? I'm making decisions like, is the solder pad big enough or do I need to make it larger, right? And every time I check that design aspect, I'm checking it against the MTBF, the failure prediction of the entire assembly, right? Because everything's interconnected. This component's next to that one. This, this weighs, I choose another component that's a little heavier, changes the reactions of vibration and shock. All of that needs to be taken into account. And I can do that in the computer with Sherlock. I'm changing packages in the case of making it cheaper, okay? And I'm changing the laminate, again, to make it cheaper or to make it pass. 
In this particular picture here, uh, you can see this is well below our, our mark here. In this case, it looks like it's 12 and, and 15. I would go back and I would start changing the laminate. I would make this thing way cheaper because it's over designed. So, you know, again, there's a whole variety of different things that we have to do as designers. It's not just performance and reliability, it is cost. Don't forget that, cost, cost, cost. Okay, uh, that brings us to just a little bit past noon here, central time. As a quick recap, you know, there are, we, we covered five, maybe, maybe a dozen. There are literally dozens of failure modes in print and circuit boards. It is nearly impossible to test all of the potential design aspects of a print and circuit board all across the board, in all of your boards, and all of your electronics while you're doing product development. We have to pick and choose. We don't have enough resources, right? Sherlock kind of levels the playing field. You do have enough resources. You're already creating ECAD data. You have to, because that has to go to the, to the manufacturer. You're, you already have defined your board. Why not plug it in and test all of those different things, all of those test points, ICTs, et cetera, all at once, right? That's what simulation is doing, is basically something that we can't economically and physically do in real life. So again, as a designer, whether you wear the electrical or the thermal or the structural hat, you are going to be responsible for the reliability. You can predict and therefore prevent any of those dozens and dozens of failure modes, right? We're reducing the cost of developing it. Your manager is going to be happy. The board of directors will be happy. The customers will be happy, et cetera. When you get that thing into production, you're going to have little to no failures, right? Or you'll have just the right amount of failure, right? If you're really dialing it in, you're going to have reduced customer returns and warranty issues because you, you're going to define the warranty. You're going to know exactly how many cycles your your electronics can can withstand before they fail. And of course, we're going to be making better products for cheaper. So. That's it in a nutshell. Um, I hope we kind of wet the whistle a little bit on the different capabilities, showed the full stack, but in reality, Sherlock is a, re is a reliability tool that combines all those different things together, whether you have the full stack of simulation or not. So um, again, Luke, thank you so much for all the, the work for putting this together. Um, this took quite, quite a bit of time. Um, we're really happy to share this workflow with you guys. And if you have any other questions, uh, we're going to open up to Q&A. Um, I'll be muting myself, and I think Luke and I are here in the same room, so we'll be kind of going back and forth on mute. And then if you have any, any questions on follow-up, please, please, uh, please don't be shy. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Jim. That was pretty exciting uh, stuff. Um, there's a lot of valuable tools in there, so we're going to open it up to some quick Q&A um, so you guys can ask any questions you have. We realize that this is might be during your lunch time or break time so if you have to leave that's okay there will be a recorded version of it that we can share with you later so um uh, we have a, you have a question from uh someone does it include uh specific structural force analysis for example buttons or, an, or a joystick being pushed or manipulated by the user Yeah, sorry. When you bring in your ECAD data, uh, short answer is yes. When you bring in ECAD data, you're defining the mounting holes, right? The mounting holes are defined in that ECAD data. So with that mounting hole definition is the boundary condition of this isn't going to move. You can then define an acceleration or a force onto that, uh, onto your board. You can define, um, probably I would use the ICT test, right? The in-circuit testing, the, the bed of nails, if you will. Uh, you can define exactly where that point load is going to be, uh, what the diameter of that point load is going to be. Maybe it'll be pushing on a component or pushing on the board next to a component. So uh, short answer, yes. Long answer, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, uh, I'm seeing other questions come through, but something that we get a lot. Um, what level of expertise do you need to have to be able to start using a tool like this? Do you need a lot of special training or is it something that you can relatively pick up quickly? It's a that's a great question. It is one that we get a lot. You know, what 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 we didn't show you guys is all of the automatic meshing and solving that's happening in Sherlock. So Again, Sherlock itself is a solver. It has a structural analysis solver built into it, and it takes advantage of the fact that everything in the electronics world is a rectangle, right? Our boards are typically rectangles. Our, our components are typically rectangles, and so it uses a very automated um, 
uh, method for meshing. So your traditional analysis sort of skill set is not needed in Sherlock because it's taken advantage of some of the, I guess, assumed simplifications that we have. It, it, it makes assumptions on where's the component located, how high is it lifted off the board, how tall is the solder pad, how does it, you know, there's, a, there's control over those things, but there's a lot of, of it automated. Traditional structural analysis tools, you have way more complex geometry. And so you have way deeper bench on meshing and you're really spending a lot of time in that, right? And, and it really comes down to what, what's the geometry you're analyzing. And in Sherlock, we're analyzing electronics, uh, which again are traditionally rectangles. Now, you don't have to use the solver in Sherlock. That's a lot of people don't understand. Yes, it has a structural solver, but you might have, and dare I say it, another software package, right? And oh, I, I don't, you know, whomever it comes from, I won't say who, who you purchased it from, but even if you use another software package to do your structural analysis, or maybe a little bit more realistic, you're not doing structural analysis, but your teammates are. You can take the results of any structural analysis tool and import them and overlay them onto Sherlock, right? I'm going to overlay the strain, for example. So let's say uh, you outsourced a, a shock and vibration uh, FEA. Those results are going to get imported into Sherlock. And then your in-house electrical uh, design will bring in the ECAD. Your in-house thermal photograph using an IR camera uh, you know, in your temp chamber, those are going to get pasted on. So Sherlock can take uh, a lot of upstream data in various forms from various um, various sources and map it all on top of itself and then combine that for reliability. So it really is a versatile tool and you don't need to be an expert in FEA to do that because in some cases you're not using the FEA side of Sherlock to, to perform the reliability analysis. Okay, that was awesome. Um, we got another question here. Does the software suggest possible layout suggestions to improve the damage or life of the components. Um, it could be a big ask, but is is that something that the software does? Yeah, yeah, because the software do our job for us. <laughs> um, not directly, right? There are, um, you know, automatic layout rules that are going to be built into your 2D ECAD program, Altium, et cetera, et cetera. Those are based on uh, design rules that are embedded into that software. You know, what we're doing with, with Sherlock is exposing the root cause of a potential future failure, right? And the root cause in this structural world is the strain of this thing is too high. Now, that thing could be, uh, could be the component itself. It could be the solder pad. It could be the connection between the the component and the solder pad, like a ball, or a, or or a lead, like a gull wing. So so it really depends on what the failure mode is, right? And then as a designer, it's our responsibility to go back and uh, and make a change, right? So uh, I have to make a, a change to the component uh, part number because the the style of gull wing it is isn't going to work, right? That's a component swap out change. Um, we're not quite there yet. I'm sure you could wrap this whole thing with our AI program, and you could certainly um, script it together with some Python or bring in some some other third-party tools. Um, it, it does have an API for for those who are curious. So I, I can connect this to to AI if I need to. Um, but um, maybe ask that question in what about a year or two? I don't know. Luke's using Chat GPT to do dad jokes on PCBs. So we're not quite there on uh, on automatic layout yet. <laughs> Okay, we got one more question and then we're going to wrap it up so you guys can get back to your day. Um, can you simulate something like a battery pack which may have uh, electrochemical processes which will affect performance? See FSAE accumulate, accumulator container? I think I know who asked that question, so thank you for asking that. Um, this tool in particular is specifically for printed circuit boards. It's specifically for uh, an input of ECAD data. So if you're looking to analyze the printed circuit board that you're using for your battery management system, yes, of course, because you're going to be bringing in that ECAD layout data. But if you want to talk about the physics of a battery cell and the electrochemical side of that, that's going to be done with one of our fluid analysis tools uh, that, will, that will have the electrochemical algorithms built into that, right? So this tool does not have any electrochemistry in it. It is specifically for stress and strain and thermal and electrical testing. Uh, we got an actual, uh, we got one more question. Um, 
So uh, what level, this is a great question, uh, what level of precision can be expected from ANSA Sherlock output considering that it requires a significant amount of inputs and how easy it is to determine if the output makes sense? Yeah, I mean, the 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 detail of the input is coming from two main sources. One, it's your ECAD data, right? So your ECAD data is going to define the level of detail of the geometry, and it's usually pretty high, right? The ECAD data is going to have enough information in it to manufacture the board. Therefore, by that account, it has to have traces, the net list, it has to have layers, it has to have all the materials called out, solder, copper, the components, and everything. So that's the first source of, say, uh, precision, if you will. Um, the next source is our database, right? And again, our database is over 600,000 components. And vast majority of them are going to overlap 100% with your bill of material. In our database, we have material properties of the copper, of the solder, right? We are the ones that are defining um, that. And that's coming from suppliers. Our database actually has information from suppliers that manufacture these components. So again, that's the source of accuracy, if you will. Then when it comes to, you know, again, precision accuracy simulation, that's that that answer can take hours to, 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 to fully develop. In this particular case, you put all your manufacturing information into ECAD data, bring it in. You take advantage of all the supplier information that's in our, um, our bill of materials or in, in our library. That's going to end up in your bill of materials. And the only thing really left after that is the, the grid or the mesh, and we have control over that. So, you know, a quick mesh sensitivity study for convergence, and you're going to get uh, the impact. The output, as far as complexity goes, can be as easy as a single MTBF, right? Here's a single number of cycles that your entire assembly uh, is going to be able to withstand. That's one number. That's about as easy as it gets, right? If that number doesn't match what you want, then you start to peel back the onion layers, right? Which is the component? Oh, there's three of them. Oh, of those three components, what's happening? Is it the component itself? Is it the solder pad it sits on? Is it the lead, et cetera, et cetera? You will then go through your sort of root cause analysis to figure out exactly how to make changes. Um, so, you know, I think from an actual, uh, from a precision standpoint, there isn't a stone left unturned because you're using all that raw native ECAD data. Um, yeah, I, I think that, does that, does that answer the question? I'm getting a head, head nod there, so. Okay, uh, uh, thank you, Corey. We're, we're going to, we're going to cut it off um, here just to respect your guys' time. If you guys would like to learn more on how this tool could specifically impact your company, Let's talk about this uh, offline. You can scan the QR code that's on your screen right now uh, to book a meeting with me where I can learn more about what you're working on. And we're happy to, to dig in to see what Sherlock can do for you. Thank you guys very much for attending today's webinar and we look forward to having you on the next one. Take it easy. Yeah. That's great.